For her book, Laura asked me to be the bridge, bridge between Adrian Rich and Jane Cortez, to write nine or 10,000 words in a journey between the terrains, if you will, of two disparate yet like-minded poets whom so many have turned to for refuge and homecoming. My own sites of refuge and homecoming have often mirrored the ethos of Rich and Cortez. Laura asked me to refer to the strength and toughness in my work and how it addresses power and vulnerability, as do Rich and Cortez. While they employ words, of course, in their search and demand for justice, I use my own visual language in a feminist call to action. For inspiration, I look to Elizabeth Salander from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Storm, do you know her from X-Men comic books? Wonder Woman, as depicted only from 1941 to 1947, and Lady Gaga, who needs no introduction at all. Now, Salander, I believe, adds much to our study of gender and empowerment. And Storm combines superpower and compassion. And Wonder Woman is as good as pop culture gets for a superhero who never kills. And Gaga just awes us with her spectacles of activism, encouraging us all to think for ourselves. So I take these and other pop culture and religious images, modify them to speak my own feminist mind, and collage them as part of my figurative sculpture. I have to admit that I've entertained fantasies of what Cortez and Rich might have said about Wonder Woman, and I write a lot about that in Hinton's book. They might have railed against the scenes in which Wonder Woman is bound and must break free of ropes and chains in this very skimpy garment she was obliged to wear. Indeed, there's a great deal of bondage in Wonder Woman comics <laughs> that, in my humble opinion, Cortez and Rich would certainly object to, as do I. So was television's Linda Carter wearing her bullet-breasted bathing suit told to take positions that bear so much of her flesh? Here's what I have to say about that. Notice how after throwing a man down, Linda Carter lifts her arms in an erotic and vulnerable manner, as if her entire body had to be exposed for the masculine gaze, masculine gaze, masculine gaze. Yes, that masculine gaze. In fact, would you even wear a bathing suit to fight the bad guys? <laughs> With my re rewritten speech bubbles, and modified outfit, Wonder Woman and I declare, no, I'd rather wear a much more protective outfit. I think the poets would have identified in principle with the nonviolent spirit of Wonder Woman. That both poet and superhero battled against tyranny brings to mind the Cortez poem, There It Is, calling for the oppressed, especially females and people of color, to fight, to resist. And if we don't fight, if we don't resist, if we don't organize and unify and get the power to control our own lives, then we will wear the exaggerated look of captivity. The exaggerated look of captivity. The poets would have found imperfection in Wonder Woman, as do I, but imperfect as she is, I adopted her into my family, my chosen family of female icons, commingling them all with my activist desire to inspire viewers to be protectors, empathizers, upstanders, rather than bystanders. I coined the 4B and use it often in my workshop. The bully, the bullied, the bystander, and the brave upstander. It's easy for kids especially to remember the 4Bs. 
In Hinton's book, I was asked to talk about the work of our nonprofit, Have Art Will Travel. We call it HART for short. So we're traveling far and wide with two exhibitions and more to come that address issues of compassion for the outsider, the ostracized, the other. With our curricular team of educational scholars, of which Anne Holt is a part, our goal is to find today and tomorrow's brave upstanders, using art to encourage empathy and activism, using art as a starting point. These upstanders will then encourage others to become everyday heroes in the elevator, in the classroom, board meeting, the quotidian events of life. At this particular event, some of the girls, they were 14 to 18, body swapped wearing the sculptures, some of my sculptures, as did, you see the two girls on the right of this photo, and all spoke so earnestly. They just exuded this desire to save the world <laughs> and wanting to make their mark on society as upstanders and leaders. It just was just terrific. In my art, in forms that can be seen as strong and androgynous, I explore the continuum between power and vulnerability in relation to masculinity and femininity, the continuum between masculinity and femininity. I address safety and danger in sculptures that could be wearable. Not all of them are wearable, but some of them are. So people can look in the mirror and see themselves in a new avatar. If you come to my studio, there are a lot of mirrors around. So people put on the sculpture and take a new look at themselves. Perhaps a new way of moving their bodies in space. Participants can body swap genders if they wish. Men and women and all the gender identities in between can explore their body presentation. And to give you an idea of how it works, you'll see the next uh, segment, which, it, which has TV anchors, Greg Kelly and Rosanna Scotto, I don't know if you know them, on Channel 5, in a television interview from three years ago, 2014. I work in my lectures, in my traveling exhibit, which is now going to 25 museums and galleries around the country. Wow. Where are you now? Where, where, now uh, we're at the Andrews Museum in North Carolina, and we're going to Penn State next in the fall. Rosanna's dying to wear this dress. Oh, yeah. Yes. May I? Uh -oh. Yes, Rosanna. So here's how it works. It goes on the body. Just watch your hair. Need we need this for later with yes. the bosses. <laughs> <laughs> with the this boss. Oh, is yeah. Ooh. Right? Wow, this is protective. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're the protected. The men like wearing it more than the women, actually, Greg. Right? Yes, we got the leather one. Just watch <laughs> the, open the Velcro. He was Stop. very this interested. Right. The men like it more than the women, off. actually. And Linda, are you? It goes on very easy. Wow. Oh, you How see, you, you always wanted breasts. breasts. It's anatomically uh, <laughs> not for me, but. The men love having breasts. I'm curious. <laughs> oh, come on. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. So, Linda, do you do commission work? I do commission work. You, well, you can see it all on lindastein.com. Lindastein.com. How strong yes. is this stuff? Ready? Now, watch this. Can Pretty we? strong. You could, uh, really? uh, you could get into but an he, empowering he wants, pose. He wants to bang into me. I know chest him. bumper. Is that all right? Chest bumper. Come on. Go for it. Wait, One, my work two. is about anti-bullying. Uh, what are you doing here? Right. That's right. Well, it's, to Stick up. up for yourself. That's Stick right. up for yourself. Get on your side. You see, she raised a fist. <laughs> All right, well, Linda Stein is very impressive. So it went on, but <laughs> you get an idea of how putting on the sculpture kind of changes people. So when Hart takes an exhibit to a rural state across the country or anywhere, we invite local performers to don my wearable sculpture and create a dance, a skit, a poem, or song exploring gender and protection. And some of them, I tell you, are so moving. Some of them are funny. Some of them are just so... Um, Sometimes the audience is in tears because people are revealing themselves and saying things they might not if they weren't wearing a sculpture. 
anyway, so I think uh, in some of my works as the outer layer of my figurative sculpture is being skins. Sometimes part of these skins can be found on the beach, like these shells were, or from black leather jackets, shoes, and belts blended with garage sale items. I'm very big on garage sales and trinkets from friends. So I ask you now if you have any old torn <laughs> leather jackets that you can't wear anymore with holes in them, but you're saving them because you love them, part with them. I'll even come pick them up from you. <laughs> the finished sculptures represent the armor we wear, the roles that we take to define and represent ourselves, and protection always at the heart of my work, is paramount in my night series, my body swapping series, the fluidity of gender series, and there are some books in the, in the back, and Rachel will be happy to help you with them uh, afterwards if you want to see some of them. And my recent series, very serious one, called Holocaust Heroes, Fierce Females. So with this series, I'm often asked, what drew you to the Holocaust? I mean, it's such a hard subject. I talk about this more in the Hinton book, but the answer in brief has to do with my obsession with the word, the idea, the feeling of protection. I created these tapestries. They're about five foot square. They're very big. They're almost sculptural to highlight 10 females who represent bravery in the face of genocidal oppression. Here are all 10 heroes together in one tapestry. And in these two details uh, from one of the tapestries, you see how I weave in my superheroes, pop culture and religious icons like Kanon, on the left. Have you heard of Kanon, some of you? Uh, the Asian goddess of mercy and protection. So I can start this conversation, so important to me, starting this conversation about strength and power, comparing real life and fantasy figures. This tapestry is all about Anne Frank, the most well-known, of course. She died in 1945 before she could live out 16 years, as you know. Look closer at these tapestries and you'll see Anne's writings from her diaries. Other heroes now are hardly known and include Noor Inyat Khan, a special operations executive agent. She could have lived her life out in luxury. Why did she put herself in such jeopardy as she did? Her father came from a noble Indian Muslim family. Muslim family, let me repeat. At times, Khan was called the spy princess because she was a descendant of an 18th century ruler of the kingdom of Mysore in southern India. Khan might have liked Lady Gaga, <laughs> who incidentally launched an anti-bullying foundation at Harvard University. So this traveling Holocaust exhibition includes one larger-than-life protector, like you see here, with a Wonder Woman shadow. It's about eight foot tall, larger than life, representing the fierceness and strength of the rescuer. It includes 20 box sculptures, like this one, each with a spoon and a shell and writing, addressing power and vulnerability. Some of the writing is what I feel uh, I might have wanted to scratch on a wall if I were in a concentration camp. And the spoon, if you read Hinton's book, represents sexual abuse during the Holocaust. So power and vulnerability. It includes a seven-minute film with Gloria Steinem and others, a book, as you could see in the back, and lots of educational workshops and performances. And by the way, I started a new series, which is in progress, called Displacement from Home, What to Leave, What to Take, Cabinets, Cupboards, Cases, and Closets. That's, uh, some of these will be at Hebrew Union College, 
starting in June, I think, summer sometime. So I've given you an idea now of several different series that I've been working on over the last 15 years. And I'd like to focus in now for a moment on one series way back from the 1990s that Laura especially wanted me to include as I bridged from Rich to Cortez. I was hesitant to do it, but now I'm really glad, Laura, that I did it. So get ready. This is called Blades, and not many know this series. Um, I took real machete blades, spent a lot of time dulling the edges. I used branch and wood forms in curvilinear formation and corkscrewed the blades, controlled them, you might say, bending the cold steel to my will. That's how I like to think of it. <laughs> Making them more graceful, turning them perhaps from swords to plowshares. This, this piece was purchased by Blanche Wiesencook and Claire Koss and hangs in their East Hampton home. I really like that piece a lot. I love corkscrewing a machete blade. The blade had an internal attraction for me as a signifier of power and protection. I felt it emitting, emitting a warning to those that might, might hurt me. It was as if I was saying, don't come too close or threaten me. I have these blades to protect me. They are my bodyguards. I, I really felt that way as I was making them. In a sculptural exhibition and installation, I attached individual invisible cords to these sculptures so they could hang in the air from the ceiling and kind of float so gracefully. And you could not discern they were machete blades until you walked very close to the art. In one group exhibition called Bad Girls, I was asked to make the most outrageous sculpture possible. The machete blade fit in just right. I felt I was taking a leap beyond sexist gender constrictions. I was examining societal notions of gender and working against association in that blades, right, are commonly associated with men and violence. I was scrambling expectations, sculpting a sensuous creation no longer capable of destruction. Was my attempt similar to Wonder Woman with her magical accoutrement, particularly those well-known wrist bracelets that I'm sure you remember? <laughs> and remember, as some of you might, that when I was creating this series, Blades, in the 1990s, the Gulf War was imminent, and newspapers were reporting daily on overseas turmoil. Giuliani was our mayor. Do you remember that? I'm sure many of you remember that. Violence seemed to be breaking out everywhere, and New York City was thought to be a place of danger for women. Media attention was focusing on crime in the streets, which was at a peak. Concerned by a growing number of women being murdered, raped, and battered, my friends and I discussed safety threats in the Big Apple. Do some of you remember that? Would you, did you have conversations? I see some shaking heads. Well, we did. We asked, how late at night should a woman ride the subway? Now, some of you younger people are gonna shake your head at this, but our answer was 8 p.m. What street posture should you take when walking alone late at night? We really had these conversations, Barbara, right? You remember this? Our answer, walk briskly with a countenance of determination, preferably in the gutter and not near doorways. This is what we talked about in the 1990s when I was taking on the machete blade. So the blade had symbolism for me. I felt it a part of my arsenal uh, that was missing from maybe my psyche. I was mesmerized by the blade's sensual slow curve at its perimeter's tip, that tip I liked. So can you understand this now? I felt so vulnerable as a girl growing up in the 50s in the Bronx, 
In my particular unfeminist family, with a personal and cultural menta mentality defining ultimate femininity as, maybe some of you could guess, Marilyn Monroe and Miss America. That's what I grew up with. The rules I learned were that girls should mask strength and smarts. Boys had to appear stronger, wiser, better than girls. In sports, I would always purposely throw the bowling ball into the alley gutter and the ping pong ball into the net. I kid you not. And on a first date, I would say something like, wow, you're a plumber. Tell me about it. <laughs> what do you do with faucets and drains? I mean, this is what I thought I had to do to be, quote, feminine, and what I had to do to help the boy be masculine. So what would it take then for me to rebel against this oppressive and stifling upbringing? What would it take for me to arm and protect myself, as well as others, hopefully, against persecutors trying to do harm? I felt a need to address this visually and viscerally as the poets address it with their powerful words. In reading two poems now by both Adrian Rich and Jane Cortez, both entitled Rape, I reflect on my obsession with protection and safety, particularly as a woman. In Rich's poem, which is going too fast for you to read, so don't try, she describes the raped woman's victimhood. She alludes to the cultural training that teaches females to, in my own words now, be afraid, conform, defer, capitulate. Rich's speaker, makes me squirm. I hate submitting to this monstrous power. A woman has no choice, the speaker, the poet speaker seems to say, but to yield to her aggressor. As I read and reread her poem, I feel myself actually being plunged into a, like a fire beneath the earth, being forced to inhabit a realm of evil and suffering. It's similar to my experience, maybe yours too, of reading works by Franz Kafka and Joyce Carol Oates. I have to literally hold my stomach when I read these authors, grit my teeth, and stiffen my body as I internalize them and Rich's poem. And I certainly do in reading Oates's Do With Me What You Will or Kafka's The Burrow. But with Rich's poem, different than Kafka and Oates, I feel there's an added dare. The unwritten finale of her poem asks me, again in my own words, how can you accept these words without fierce resistance? The power to resist. Have you seen last Sunday's New York Times? Uh, you probably did. It had the word resist on its magazine cover. This is the time in which we live. But I won't get into all that now, and I won't mention the T word. <laughs> Jane Cortez's poem, Rape, follows directly on, this, on the heels of this tacit question and need to resist. In her poem, as we'll hear next, Cortez fumes and bursts forth violently and noisily, scattering fra fragments widely and unapologetically. Rape. Two rape cases in the 1980s. What was Inez Garcia supposed to do for the man who declared war on her body? The man who carved a combat zone between her breasts. Was she supposed to lick crabs from his hairy ass? She's so gentle. <laughs> Strong words. If you skip a few lines in this same poem, you'll hear. And what was Joanne Little supposed to do for the man who declared war on her life? Was she supposed to tongue his encrusted toilet stool lips? So ladylike. <laughs> 
For me, Joe Ann Little and Inez Garcia morph into the Swedish movie protagonist Lisbeth Salander. I can't help it from the girl with the dragon tattoo. For Joanne, Inez, and Lisbeth, pressure builds from their victimization and detonates in a violent explosion as each strikes back. The villain is vanquished. My blades express my determination to vanquish the villain, to become an upstander. I join Rich and Cortez in asking, do only white males have the right to agency and autonomy? Must females be passive in the face of misogynist atrocities? I seek to inspire empathy and the spirit of the protector, as do Adrian Rich and Jane Cortez in their poetry. With these poems and perhaps sculpture, the possibility is raised that we each have inside ourselves untapped bravery. As a visual artist, I strive to have that bravery. I strive to be fierce. Thank you. Mm -hmm.